all philosophy would change, at least in the universities, if tonight's lecture can make its point. In principle, we're talking really about what Plato in the Phaedo describes as true philosophy. If it is correct that death is an out-of-body experience and the whole beginning of the Phaedo, some greatest part of it deals with this process of dying and being in a state of death, then if it could be reduced to some process, some method, then we would be introducing a kind of, let me give it a name, a yoga of death. One A and one B for three units at the local college and university. The Greeks wouldn't call it a yoga, they'd call it a paideia, because that's the process, the highest process of nurturing the highest sense of educating. But we'll use the common word yoga. Well, let's take a look at how he builds this. Plato is very artful. He starts it on one level and he builds it kind of like a crescendo. And then it has subsidiary themes that he casts in front of him that then resolve themselves on a higher level. Let's. Uh, See how he does it. The Phaedo is Plato's dialogue that centers around the death of Socrates. He's in jail, awaiting death. Therefore, we have a very interesting scene for the whole subject of death, since Socrates is waiting his, his execution. And so he has a dialogue with the people about him, and Socrates says that uh, if Evanus is wise, he'll come after me as quickly as he can. And people are shocked because they know Socrates is going to be put to his death. And so they want to know, what do you mean by that? If he is wise, all right, if he is wise, why would he then want to come after me as quickly as he can? Socrates then adds to the drama and he says, so will every man who has any worthy interest in philosophy. And he says, of course, look here. While it's true that it is not permitted to take one's life, suicide, but that the philosopher would desire to follow after the dying. Now, it looks like, therefore, we have a group of people who want, desire it, desire death, want to pursue it, want to get into it, and others want to avoid it just as much, if not more, right? right. Avoid death as long as possible. He says, ah, these are the true philosophers. They want, they deserve it. I said, you know, these human beings for whom it is better to die cannot without impiety good for themselves. They must wait for some benefactor. Right, they have to wait for some benefactor. This is a curious notion. It applies to both. It applies to both. But we want to see in what way it applies to the philosopher. Now look. It's the reason we can't arbitrarily end our life is because we are the chattels of the gods. We are their possessions. Therefore, we don't have a right to kill ourselves. A man cannot kill himself until God sends some necessity upon him. Some necessity. He says, that's what's happened to me. 
now. God is our guardian, and we are his possessions. He reasons this way. And finally it reaches a crisis, you see, and they reject this review. And he says, all right then, I'll tell you what. He said, you people here be my judges, and let me reason it out and try to show you what I mean. He makes three points, and then he adds a third, and that starts the drama of the dialogue. He says, I believe I'm going to other wise and good gods. One. I'm going to men better than those here. And I'm going to gods who are good masters. So he's got wise and good and masterful gods. And he thinks he's going to men who are better than those that are here. Therefore, he has some view about the afterworld that includes those elements. But then he goes on and adds a fourth. He says, but those who have spent his life in philosophy are naturally of good courage. You see, because they're going to attain the greatest blessings in that other land. So, what does he expect? He's going to go to wise and good gods. They're all good masters. He's going to encounter men better than they are here. And he thinks, therefore, those who spent their life in philosophy are naturally of good courage, and they're going to attain the greatest blessings. One. All right. Two. Three. Four. That's his goal. But behind it, he has to talk about what kind of a death it is that these philosophers are pursuing. If he's wise, should come after me as quickly as he can, so will every man who has any worthy interest in philosophy. Yet the philosopher desires to follow after the dying. Well, I've selected about 10 or 11 quotes in a series that I'd like to share with you, that he's going to build his case. And um, he starts by making the most important distinction, because it should wake us up. Other people are not likely to be aware that those who pursue philosophy are right study nothing but dying and being dead. That's what philosophy is. That's their subject. Dying and being dead. Because if you're successful in the dying, you'll reach death. The problem is, you see, that people do not know in what way real philosophers desire death, nor in what way they deserve death, nor what kind of death it is. Right? They do not know in what way there's a certain way of dying. So he has to then die in a certain way. Right? There's, a, there's a way, there's a method. Right? He must die in a certain way. 
because they don't know the way the real philosophers desire death, nor in what way they deserve death, and most especially, they don't know what kind of death it is. There's a certain kind of death. Kind of death. Hmm. They don't know in what way real philosophers desire it. Because huh? they desire it. They desire it. Huh? And this idea of death then must be of a different kind than what these people over here understand to be death. It's a different kind of death. So they don't really know that. Okay, that's good. Because they don't know in what way real philosophers desire death, nor in what way they deserve it, nor what kind of death it is. So here we get his idea of what death is. And notice there's going to be a difference between these two. Death and the state of being death, dead. Right? He's, and he makes this real clear, right? Uh, Here lies, right, and here are the daisies being pushed up. Right. Death is the separation of the soul from the body. Right. Here's the body. Now, if there is a separation, right, there's the soul. That's death. That can take place then or here. What's the difference? Death is the separation of the soul from the body. That's all it is. But the state of being dead is the state in which the body is separated from the soul and exists alone by itself. What is it? Right, and the state of being dead, right, the body remains alone by itself. There it is, it stays, it's alone by itself. And the soul is separated from the body in that beautiful picture and exists alone by itself. Now, my friend, if you agree with me, do you not? Do you think a, a philosopher would be more likely to care much? Pardon me, pardon me. Is death anything more than this? No, he said that's what death is. What is it? Separation of the soul from the body. Whenever that takes place. This is when the separation takes place and they they are alone by itself, respectively. Now, now he goes through a very interesting kind of sideline which tries to talk about what are the ways in which we separate our soul from our body in our everyday world. So he's going to this one now. He says, look, you know, when you... Uh, uh, when you're involved in the so-called pleasures, such as eating and drinking, he says, you know, um, if you don't care much for that, if you don't clear, care much for the possession of fine clothes and shoes and other personal ornaments, except insofar as they're necessary, right? such a man then wouldn't devote himself to the body. He would uh, turn a, be actually turning away from the body. 
to the degree that he is not involved, not involved, absorbed, except insofar as it is necessary. That's a kind of separation, separating yourself from the cares of the body. So in that sense, you're separating yourself from the body. In other words, there's an ethical withdrawal from the involvement with the body. To begin with then, it is <clears throat> to begin with then, it is clear that in such matters the philosopher separates the soul from communion with the body. And they have some fun while he's just about as good as dead and they both, everyone chuckles. He says, now look here, <clears throat> how about the, uh, the acquirement of pure knowledge? Is the body a hindrance? Or must you use the body in the search for wisdom? He says, no, he said, uh, it's only when we separate from the body that we really function in the quest for knowing. He does it in two ways. Then said he, when does the soul attain to truth? For when it tries to consider anything in the company with the body, it's deceived. All right. In the body, it's deceived by the senses. In thought, if at all, something of the realities becomes clear to it, partial. It thinks best then when none of these things troubles it, neither hearing nor sight nor pain nor pleasure, but as far as it's possible, alone by itself takes leave of the body. And avoiding so far as it can all association or contact with the body. In that sense, it's reaching out towards reality. It's in this matter also, then, that the soul of the philosopher greatly despises the body and avoids it, and strives to be alone by itself. And now he talks to this middle range of reflection, using the reason, contemplating. And um, he then shifts, and that's what I'd like to go through for the moment. Would not the man do this most perfectly, separating himself from the body, who approaches each thing as far as possible with reason alone? not introducing sight into his reasoning, nor dragging in any of the other senses along with his thinking, but who employs pure, absolute reason in his attempt to search out the pure, absolute essence of things. And he removes himself as far as possible from the eyes and the ears and the word from this whole body, because he feels that its companionship disturbs the soul, hinders him from attaining truth and wisdom. Well, then there's a shortcut down. The body's a hindrance. Our argument must be pretty clear then. So as long as we have the body and the soul is contaminated by such a, an evil, we'll never attain completely what we desire. That is the truth. The body keeps busting in and interrupting us. Sometimes it makes it impossible to think at all. But the worst of it is that if we do get a bit of leisure and turn to philosophy, the body is constantly breaking in upon our studies and disturbing us with noises and confusions. And so it presents our beholding the truth. And in fact, we perceive that if we are ever to know anything absolutely, we must be freed from the body. and must behold the actual realities with the eye of the soul alone. That's our only solution. All right, now let's add that. Because of the hindrances, insofar as we're there, you're never going to see it, but there is an eye of the soul, which I've just drawn with my skill. That eye of the soul does see, but it can only see when it's free from the body. And that's the problem.
Well, it looks like knowledge is impossible while we have the body. That's all there is to it. Or you can only get it when you drop dead. Either it cannot be acquired at all or only when we're dead. Unless uh, or until uh, God uh, himself sets us free. And in this way, I guess, we can say, freeing ourselves from the foolishness of the body and being pure, we shall, I think, he says, be with the pure. And then we'll know of ourselves all that is pure. And that is perhaps the truth. So he says, well, we know the condition for truth. We know how the body interferes with the pursuit of truth, interrupts us all the time, doesn't allow us to see clearly. Well, it's not possible then, so long as we have a body, or you have to wait until you die. Now he inter introduces something new. He said, perhaps then we should, uh, we shall ourselves know the truth if we become pure. Then, says Socrates, if this is true, my friend, I have great hopes that when I reach the place to which I am going, I shall there, if anywhere, attain fully to that which has been my chief object in my past life, so that the journey which is now imposed upon me has begun with good hope. And a like hope exists for every man who thinks that his mind has been purified and made ready. Well then, One way of understanding it then is that this person, his whole life as a philosopher, the life of philosophy, must be ascetic. Right? He's withdrawing from the body during his entire life. This represents his entire life. Until then he's purified, and then when he drops dead, this takes place, the separation of soul from the body. And then it's the belief in the afterworld in which he will then experience truth. But this idea of purification is quite interesting. And it's in this idea of purification we get the whole thesis of the separation of the soul from the body. Let me give it to you. It's all in one, one or two paragraphs. And does not the purification consist in this, which has been mentioned long ago in our discourse, in separating as far as possible the soul from the body and teaching the soul the habit of collecting and bringing itself together from all parts of the body and living so far as it can, both now and hereafter, alone by itself, freed from the body as if from fetters. I'll occur. There's the idea that man, right, the soul of man, or our sense of awareness, permeates our being. It's not located in one specific place. Because we immediately feel whatever it is we touch, and we're in communication internally with the things going on to an interesting degree in our bodies. He says, therefore, what we have to learn to do is to collect this all together. To collect this all together. And separate it.
That's death. That's death. Here and now. All right, that's what he says. Now, as well as hereafter. I'm going to read it again. And does not the purification consist in this which has been mentioned long ago in our discourse in separating as far as possible the soul from the body and teaching the soul the habit of collecting and bringing itself together from all parts of the body and living as far as it can both now and hereafter alone by itself, freed from the body as if from fetters. He says, this is what we call death. This is what we call death. Now, if that's possible to experience now as well as hereafter, then for this person, they gain an experience of death before they drop dead in the state of death. Wow, what is so important about this? Well, we did speak about the fact that the soul is said to have an eye or a pilot of the soul. So then, let's give Plato the possibility of such an experience. And then all we want to know is, what does it see? What does it encounter? What can we learn from it? He said, but hey, you know, he says, uh, what we hold to be true is that true philosophers, and they alone, are always most eager to release the soul, and just this, the release and separation of the soul from the body is is their study, is this their study or is it not? This is their study. This is what they want to master. Well, as he says, it's absurd if a man has spent all his life fitting himself to live as nearly as possible in the state of death, should, when it comes, be disturbed that it comes. Therefore, all right, 67A, 67E, in fact, the true philo philosophers practice dying, and death is less terrible to them than to any other men. Consider it in this way. They are in every way hostile to the body, and they desire to have the soul apart by itself alone. Would it not be very foolish if they should be frightened and troubled when this very thing happens? And if they should... Uh, and if they should not be glad to go to the place where there is hope of attaining what they've longed for. And what they've longed for is wisdom. Now, how can we put this idea in here? Well, like, how does this fit? Why does he say that that's wisdom? That's a real curiosity. If he is a real philosopher, he's really a philosopher, he'll confidently believe that he will find pure wisdom nowhere else than in this other world. That's what he believes. So, he believes he'll find it. There's therefore some kind of a connection between these two things, and we're not any closer to understanding it. Huh? Let's take a look some more. And then he makes a whole talk about all of the virtues. And he says, oh, by the way, you can talk about courage and temperance, justice, all of these things. But he said, you know, in truth, there's only just one. This is the one coin by which we exchange all virtues.
My dear Simeus, I suspect this is not the right way to purchase virtue by exchanging pleasures for pleasures and pains for pains and fear for fear and greater for less as if they were coins. But the only right coinage for which all those things must be exchanged and by means of which all these things are to be bought and sold is wisdom and courage and self-restraint and justice. In short, true virtue exists only with wisdom. Whether pleasure and fears and other things of that sort are added or taken away. Virtue, which consists in the exchange of such things for each other without wisdom, is but a slavish thing. The truth is, in fact, the purification of all these things. And self-restraint, justice, courage, and wisdom itself are a kind of purification. His life spent my whole life trying to become a true philosopher. And that's where he calls himself a mystic. The thyrist bearers are many, but the mystics few. And these mystics are, I believe, those who have been true philosophers. And I, in my life, have, so far as I could, left nothing undone and have striven in every way to make myself one of them. This is mysticism. This is mysticism. This is mysticism. This is the mystic way. That's what he says. That's what it is. That kind of a practice is mysticism. But we haven't gotten any closer to understanding what that experience is, what it's like, and why he calls it wisdom. So I want to write down three quotes where I'm going. The soul, <clears throat> the invisible, right, departs into another place which is like itself, noble, pure, invisible, to the realm of the God of the other world in truth, to the good and wise God, whether if God wills my soul is soon to go. I'm skipping. But the truth is, much rather this, if it departs pure, dragging with it nothing of the body because it never willingly associated with the body in life, but avoid it and gather itself into itself alone. See? It gathered itself into itself alone since this has always been its constant study, since this has always been its constant study, this is its study. Again, he says that this is its study. But this means nothing else than it pursued philosophy aright, and it really practiced being in a state of death. Or is not this the practice of death? By all means. Then, if it is in such a condition, it goes away into that which is like itself, into the inv invisible, the divine, and the mortal, and the wise. And when it arrives there, it is happy, freed from the error and folly and fear. But 
Then he has a line which is reminiscent of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And then it, it, it lives in truth through all after time with the gods, right? Unending. So where does it go? It goes to what is like itself, invisible, divine, immortal, and wise, like itself. Therefore, there's a kinship between these, it's like itself, invisible, divine, immortal, wise. Certainly invisible and certainly immortal because it just died and survived death, so therefore it is deathless. Wisdom. Can need more a little bit more about that. And no one who has not been a philosopher and is not wholly pure when he departs is allowed to enter the communion of the gods. But only the lover of knowledge, this kind of knowledge. Therefore, those who take care of their souls they feel they know where they're going. Quote, they themselves believe that philosophy with its deliverance and purification must not be resisted, and so they turn and follow in whatsoever it leads. How do you do this? I'm skipping for a moment. The lovers of knowledge, I say, perceive that philosophy taking possession of the soul, when it's in this state, encourages it gently and tries to set it free, pointing out that the eyes and the ears and the other senses are full of deceit and urging it to withdraw from these, except insofar as their use is unavoidable and exhorting it to collect and concentrate itself within itself and to trust nothing except itself and its own understanding. They use the word thought, but it's understanding. Right. Exhorting it to collect, again, to collect and concentrate itself, to concentrate itself within itself and to trust nothing except itself and its own understanding of reality. They use the word existence, but existence should be the word reality. Well, how is it apprehended? And to believe that there is no truth in that which, is, which it sees by any other means and which varies with the various objects in which it appears, since everything of that kind is visible and apprehended by the senses, whereas the soul itself sees that which is invisible and apprehended by the mind. Ah! The eye of the soul is the mind. The kinship between the soul and the mind the eye of the soul is mine. Wisdom is the very highest aspect of mind. They're akin.
Não. At, I want to go back to one quote. But the soul, invisible, departs into another place which is like itself, noble, pure, invisible, to the realm of the God of the other world in truth, to the good and the wise God, whether if God wills, my soul is soon to go. But the truth Put the truth, or, or, or the truth is much rather this. If it departs pure, dragging with it nothing of the body, because it never wholly associated with the body in life, but avoided it, gathered itself into itself alone, since this has always been its constant study, this means nothing else than that it pursued philosophy of right and really practiced being in a state of death. And this is the practice of death. Then, if it's in such a condition, it goes away into that which is like itself, the, the invisible, the divine, the immortal, and wise. And when it arrives there, it is happy, freed from error and folly and fear, and fierce loves and all the other human ills. It lives in truth through all after time with the gods. So, this is the sketch, therefore, of death as an experience. With these quotes, if one were going to teach philosophy according to this, then, it would have to be a yoga, how to gather and concentrate itself into itself, and to separate it apart so it can be apart and alone by itself. One would have to then uh, find out why Socrates says, or Plato, that the eye of the soul is the vehicle through which you can gain an insight into wisdom, because the eye of the soul is mind. And what you encounter, therefore, is the immortal, invisible, divine, wise, or wisdom. That's what you encounter. And the consequences of this is you gain, gain a a place with the gods throughout all time. Put it in Buddhist terms, that's getting off the wheel of life. That's getting out of the world of reincarnation. Therefore, we have the same structure here, the Buddhist clan. It's in Greek thought, Plato. Now, most people want to say that philosophy really is learning arguments, the exercise of reason in arguments. You see, this is exercising reason, too. You have to learn all the steps and what it's involved. Have to see how all these distinctions can be made. Our kind of learning in the universities is rather this. And Socrates deals with that in the Phaedo in such an excellent way that I would like to turn to it.
When Simeus and Cebes hear all of this talk, they come back When Socrates had finished, it's all finished. Cebes answered and said, Socrates, I agree to the uh, other things you say, but in regard to the soul, men are very prone to disbelief. All right, men are. They fear when the soul leaves the body, it no longer exists anywhere, and that on the day when the man dies, it's destroyed and perishes. When it leaves the body and departs from it, straight away it flies away and is no longer anywhere, scattering like the breath of smoke. If it exists anywhere by itself as a unit, freed from the evils which you just enumerated just now, there'd be good reason for the blessed hope, Socrates, that what you say is true. But perhaps no little argument and proof is required to show that when a man is dead, the soul still exists and has any power and intelligence. Hmm. What does he want? He wants an argument to show that when a man is dead, the soul still exists and has power and intelligence. He wants an argument to show that when the soul departs, whether it's here or here, it doesn't in, it seems very clear that he doesn't understand this. He's talking about this, but it would apply to both. He says, can you show by argument that the soul exists after such a departure? It could be just like smoke, scattered into the wind, puffs away. So does the soul exists after that separation. And even if it does exist, you have to add two things to it. Does it have any power and intelligence? Because suppose you did have a soul, but it had no power and no intelligence, then you wouldn't be able to know anything. You wouldn't have, be able to be aware of the fact that you either know or you don't know. And if it hadn't any power, you couldn't do anything anyhow. So he says, look, I need three things. I need an argument to show that the soul exists, it has power and intelligence. What does he want? He wants an argument. Socrates could have said, excuse me, didn't you follow this? Didn't I say several times that the real study of the philosopher is the practice and the study of separating the soul from the body? If you want to know whether it exists or not, why don't you find out? Why don't you do the exercise? Why don't you do it? Then you'll see whether it exists. <laughs> you want to see if it has any power? Well, if you can collect it from all of the body, from all parts of the body, concentrate it in itself, so that it then can, with the mind, perceive the very nature of reality as wisdom, well, you'll know, therefore, whether or not it has any power, because seeing, having a vision is a power, and you'll also know whether it has any intelligence. Of course, it doesn't have intelligence, it participates in intelligence, but Simeus doesn't pick that up. He just wants to know an argument that would show whether or not, the, pardon me, he wants to show that on death the soul does exist and it has power and intelligence. In this picture, we don't have intelligence, we then participate in it through mind. That's the doctrine of participation in Plato. So Socrates hears that, he could do perhaps what you and I might do at that time, say, look here, you want me to go back over what I just did? I've talked about it many times, you don't seem to be able to keep it in your memory. No, he doesn't do that. This is what he does. All right, I want to just pick up the first sentence. Socrates, I agree to the other things you say, but in regard to the soul, men are very prone to disbelief. They fear that when the soul leaves the body, not, not uh, Cebes' answer, men is putting on others. So Socrates comes back and he says, 
What you say, Seabees, is true. And that's what men think. Now, what shall we do? Not them. What shall we do? Do you wish to keep on conversing about this to see whether it is not true, probable or not? Do you want to see whether this is probable or not? Therefore, the whole rest of the argument, or pardon me, not just argument, the whole dialogue from this point on to the end of the dialogue is a study of these arguments. And there are three. What most men object to about this theory, what Seabees objects to it, and what Simeus objects to it. And Socrates wants to see whether or not their arguments, I see, he will show whether their arguments are probable. All he has to show is that their arguments against this position are improbable. He doesn't take them through an argument to show the necessity of this. He says, look here, let's, how shall we answer their objections? See, um, all of their arguments are objections to this theory. So Socrates says, well, I'll tell you what, shall we see, shall we converse about this and see whether their arguments are probable or not? He shows they're improbable. Therefore, when we take philosophy to be nothing other than learning arguments and the exercise of reasoning and arguments, that's philosophy as a probable. That's a probable. This is probable. This is not philosophy. This is philosophy. Being able to structure your mind, deal with this issue, this is philosophy. Sure, you can apply what you've learned here to show the improbability of arguments against it, and you can have fun doing it in dialogue, and you can become skillful at it, at it to show that people's fears, because what he ultimately does here is to show that the objection they have against it, see, the objection they have, the objection they have is not because they accept some theory, but they fear some alternative which is unrealistic. So all he does is he listens to their argument, he notices on what basis their fear is, and then he shows how that fear is groundless, and he shows the argument they use to support their objection is groundless or improbable. Therefore, this is what philosophy is about, the quest for wisdom. And in any intense experience, mystical experience, you can always talk about that passage from the everyday world into the mystic process as a separation of the soul from the body. Because when you are in profound states, you are not at that point being interrupted by the body. It is a separation of the body in terms of what he talks about. Therefore, this entire exercise is a training of the mind, kind of a yoga of death, as we're calling it. And it's this yoga of death that is true philosophy. And if this were taught in the universities, they would be getting back to Plato. They don't do that. They're not interested in it. But that's the heart of what Socrates, or through Socrates' Plato, Plato says in the dialogue. Now, he has a great deal of fun with reason. He has myths and he has allegories. He has similes. He has models. He has whole involved allegories that go for pages and pages, like the allegory of the cave in the upper world. He has a clear understanding of human nature. But all of that comes together not to try to train people to reason and argue with one another. This is called heuristic by Plato. He says, this is heuristic. Learning to argue just to win, that's not dialectic. That's not dialectic. 
discovering the ideas that you have that may block you from this kind of experience, to discover the blocks that block you from this experience, he says, that's what you need the dialectic for. That's the dialectic to show you that your fears are groundless. You have to understand that that's natural and a natural progression. That's where the dialectic comes. You can start learning it here as a process, but its proper application is in the higher. Well, this short little talk tonight is what I wanted to cover on the idea of death, and I appreciate any of your questions that you want to, might want to explore in it. That's exactly the whole method. Well, what is that technique? Oh, uh, see, that, that is the method. That's what's remarkable and, and wonderful about this method. We find that, that Socrates is famous for this kind of meditation, standing. In the modern age, we're influenced by Zen Buddhism, which is a, literally a sitting Buddhism. Chan is a sitting Buddhism. And either way, what would it be like, literally, to try to draw the awareness from all parts of your body, out of your body, from every part? Well, that's what you'd be doing. That's all you'd have to be doing. Isn't that nice and simple? It has to become a habit. See, it has to become a habit. It has to be a practice. And this is something that he repeats in many dialogues. At least that's what he says. Let me read you the paragraph. And does not the purification consist in this, which has been mentioned long ago in our discourse, in separating as far as possible the soul from the body and teaching the soul the habit of collecting and bringing itself together from all parts of the body and living so far as it can, both now and hereafter, alone by itself. Can that teaching be taught? It's better than that. What more do you need? Mike, look here. I need some guidance on how to do yeah, that. Yeah, wait, 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 see. That's what I need. Yeah, that's okay. Here in this beautiful picture, is it not true that right now you can direct your attention to your feet? Would you agree you can address your attention to the back of your head? You can do it to your thumbs. You can do it to your elbows. Agree? Now look here, why don't you just for a few moments see whether or not you are aware of any sensation beneath your knees. Is it possible to say to yourself that you're interested in drawing that awareness up right now? Like right now? Drawing it up here, what is that? 
I don't know. Would you agree you can, you can become aware of any part of your body by dropping your own awareness to any part of the body? We just did it. Can you not equally go backwards? Is it equally possible to say that I want to draw whatever consciousness I have of my body out of my body from all parts of the body? Pardon me? That isn't easy for me to say yes to. It's a constant practice, and you either see it makes sense or it doesn't make sense. That's all. Tell me. I think you do it very well already. Fair enough? Shall we try it? Yes. All right. Say, how do you fall asleep? How do you fall asleep? It's uh, kind of a habit. I know. What do you do? I uh, go to a place that I've prepared that is very comfortable. Uh huh. Comfort. Prepared. Go ahead. Go ahead. I go there when I'm tired. Yeah, go ahead. I'm ready to sleep. Feel my yeah, then, now you're in bed. What do you do? Do you fall asleep right as soon as you hit the bed? Sometimes. Exactly at that moment? No. Oh, thank you. What do you do to fall asleep? Consider it. What do you do when you fall asleep? You uh, wiggle your toes for 10 minutes. No. What do you do? What do you do? It's still. Still? And then what do you do? Relax. What, how do you do that? Um, how do you I relax? Let, what? I let my mind drift. And you let your mind drift. You release it, mm -hmm. right? Look. She releases it, you relax, you let your mind drift, go ahead, then what? It, I, it goes away, it just... Uh, <laughs> you notice anything about your breathing? Um, it's deeper. Deeper? Hmm, go ahead. Sir, go ahead. What do you do? Well, my only question about this is, if, if it's... I've just awakened from sleep and I go to lay down. I'm not going to fall asleep, probably. I mean, there's also an aspect of this where my body is needing to go to sleep. It feels different to me than this meditation bringing something up and letting it out. I don't mind a bit. Would you agree, though, you are aware of a process? Yes, there's, right. there's a certain... Would you agree it's habitual? Yeah. Right. It's a method. Everyone has their own. Yeah, well, most people have a particular curious way in which they do it. That is to say, you have a yoga of sleep. It's your own. This is the yoga. It means basically doing nothing other than trying it and watching it. That's what I'm saying as a yoga to eating when I'm hungry. I can eat because I'm hungry. And when I'm tired, I can sleep. Well, is it possible you might want, you might desire <clears throat> you might desire to do this? Yes, very much. Alright. It seems so different to me. I'm being honest, but I... Look here, look here. It looker. seems totally different. You would agree, would you not, that right now, right, you can uh, feel the top of your head? Yes. Right, or a certain area? Yeah. How about the back of the head? Hmm? Hmm. Is there some way in which you might say that um, 
that you can draw yourself up or draw your awareness to this point. Let me add one more thing. Is there some sense in which even to fall asleep you have to drop it? You have to drop it all? Yes. Dropping it all is lifting up. You see, wouldn't it be interesting if we could stay awake while we're falling asleep? Now that is a yoga of sleep. The whole game of the yoga of sleep is to see whether or not you can see this passage between awake and asleep. The whole yoga is an internal yoga. And all you're going to do is to try to extend that wakefulness as much as you can to see the very process of going asleep or falling asleep. There isn't any method. There isn't any method. You either try it or you don't try it. You either repeatedly try it or you don't. This is a yoga. This is a yoga. Now, the curiosity in this yoga is that when we tell ourselves to drop it all, right? We can also tell ourselves to drop it all here in sitting or standing. Plato used Socrates stand, stood for, that was his practice, standing. And both the meditative states. But when you drop it all, when you decide, I'm mean, finished with it, you know, I'm finished with all the talk, finished with everything, I, mean, I want to drop it all. That is a separation, you see. That is a separation. That is a separation from cares, from interests, the things you're attached to or attracted towards. You're dropping it. That's a separation. There are two things, see? He says two things. There's a separation and a release. And these are different. The separation is the dropping it all, see? Then you have to be willing to release yourself. That's an out-of-body experience. They go together. And many people, in many ways, when they get close to that, a fear comes in, a terror. Will I ever get back? This is weird. I think I like it. Rather keep this stuff to yourself. I'd rather be the way I am. And therefore, they don't take it, and they end it. Some children have the same fear of sleep. Well, maybe they won't wake up. It's terrible. Similar fear. Now, um, dropping it all. All right, that's what it is. That's the first part. All right? That's the separation. Drop it all. Concern yourself with nothing other. See whether or not it's possible in that dropping at all, whether there's also an upward turn. Right, an upward turn, up and out. See, try it. See what happens, do it. Try the sleeping yoga, try that. Similar. A better one, dealing with the same thing, is if you're watching your thoughts, see whether you can discover what's in between any two thoughts. See, these are all transitions. These are transitions. It's in the transition from one medium to the other that there's a chance for a breakthrough. 
life and death. That's the chance for a breakthrough. Between two thoughts. Hey, another one. The Hatha Yoga. This is what they study, the in and the out. When you exhale, that moment when it shifts to inhale, and when you inhale and it shifts to the out, exhaling, both the transitions, that's another moment. Same thing, they're all moments of transition. And what do you do there? Nothing. Just watch. Cultivate watchfulness about this. See whether at some point you can help it a bit or focus more on it or be sensitive to it. See, the irony to this is, is behind your question. It's a very fine question. And here's the irony, right? If this doesn't take tw any number of steps to do, then we are very close to the transition right now. And it doesn't require this, an endless number of steps and duties. That is, suppose it doesn't translate into work. This is work. Suppose it's not work at all. Suppose it's just simply transition. And the only way you can have a transition is to allow it to take place. That's the release. Okay. Then be aware of the fact there's a separation. So study it. Don't do this at all now. Don't ever think of it. Forget it. Just study the how do you go to sleep. Get used to that for a while and you'll see you can gain a great deal of insight into it. There's a whole wonderful process in this. And those who really do it well go the next step and they go from asleep to awake and catch that too. No method. Watch, study, do it in one, do it in all. As I begin to understand this whole picture from Plato, a question would come to me is, is my soul why would my soul ever have been in a body? Is my, if I'm spending time getting my soul out of the body, is my soul then in any way improved by having this experience in my body? Sure. My sense would be that possibly that could be that it's as if you have an unbridled soul and the body is a kind of polishing stone for it, for to kind of refine it towards wisdom. Is that possible? Without a doubt. You see, um, Meaning the body is pretty damn useful, really, too. Yeah, let me see if I can put it in another way. This is a very lofty goal. This is a very lofty goal, separation of the soul and the body. All of these are great yogas. Therefore, you're going to be blocked again and again and again. And learning how to go through those blocks is our nurturing. Is our nurturing. Is our learning. But the, but the most interesting thing about it is that it means we are very close as a human race. We're very close to this kind of a state if it doesn't require 15 steps or three steps. Well, just, you don't have to go through college to get it. It doesn't take prerequisites, but it does take diligence and, and courage. This is the word he always uses, courage. See? It takes courage to face this. Because all the fears that you're leaving something more real, all of the fears, you'll find all the fears come up. And being able to conquer free fears as you pursue a meaningful goal is growth. What would it mean for the person, come on, let's see whether we can push it one more step. What would it mean for the person who can do this? What can they then walk away with? And why would we say that's significant? To do it before you drop dead. 
Like, what difference does it make? Suppose someone can do it or has done it. What do they know that the others who are caught and can't do it, won't do it, are not interested in doing it? What separates them? How are they different? Number one, there's no doubt anymore about whether or not there's a reality. There's no doubt anymore whether or not that reality, when experienced, is mindful, that is, wisdom. There's no doubt to those people that that experience can be called beauty itself. There's no doubt about, any, about anyone having this experience, that being bathed in that experience is happiness, real happiness. There's no doubt about the fact that in that, your efforts are justified. Therefore, in one sense, the nature of the reality that we are part of, part and parcel of, of, is not alien to us. But there has to be some, some kinship, some kinship between the gods or the divine and ourselves. Because we are, and because of an essential point that he makes here, we discover that this divine is, we are, right, our soul is like it. Ah! We are akin to the gods. We are akin to the divine. Now, you can fashion all kinds of arguments, if you want, to try to make that point, difficult as it might be. But that's different than doing something like this and discovering it yourself. For what you discover is the same for everyone who discovers it. They all discover the same thing. It's not relative, therefore. Now, is that a learning? Yes. Here's, the, here's, the, here's the curious thing about it. That's the kind of learning that you can't forget. It's the kind of learning you don't have to remember. It's better than learning how to ride a bicycle. If you learn how to ride a bicycle, you don't forget how to ride a bicycle. If you know you know how to swim, you never forget that you know how to swim. This is the same kind of knowing. You know. But what was the soul before this journey? Pardon? But what was my soul before this journey? Just the way it is now, except you didn't know it was capable of doing it. In other words, the soul is getting to know that it is. Yeah. yeah. And being in this existence is a way to filter through yeah. some of that yeah. comprehension. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the fun thing about Plato now is that now he's going to deal with what do you gain then? with his mythology of what happens to the soul after death, and he has a whole myth about it. And therefore, to go further into this, we'd have to see what happens to the kind of person who does this versus those who don't, which is then a journey of the, uh, or a story about the journey of the soul into the next world. And that's the Plato's Phaedrus and the Phaedo, all of his myths taken together or his mythology of the, uh, of the uh, afterworld can be put together into one mosaic and you can see it all stretched out. So it's kind of a geography of the soul's travels into the next world. And, and the beauty of philosophical midwifery is it's, it's a way to see the blocks. It's, it's, it's a way to go straight into the blocks. Yeah. Yeah. What a great kid. Okay. Thank you. Fine.